Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Are you ready to increase your joy, build trust, strengthen your relationship with God? Now is the time. Reach your goals. Press on and get spiritually fit. Hitting the faith gym. Well, good morning. How are you today? Uh, welcome online if you're joining us with us. We're glad you're here. We are in a series called Hitting the Faith Gym. Growing our faith a lot like you'd go to a gym and in that same then you that same feel, I am your personal trainer, and I'm excited about that because you'll get a lot more results with a personal trainer when you're in the gym. And uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about how to grow in our faith, how to become strong, how to go from weak in your faith to strong in your faith, just like you would, uh, like if you were to join a gym, you want to gain in strength. And when we're in a gym, especially when it's crowded, it can be... Uh, somewhat chaotic. Sometimes people's workouts collide. So we're going to talk about that today, how to overcome that. And uh, let me just tell you straight up, if you've spent a while since you've been in a gym or you haven't been in one, there's some etiquette that goes into going into the gym and working out, especially when it's busy. Let me give you some, some, uh, some, some tips, okay? Some guidelines or etiquette guidelines that you would be helpful for you. And uh, it really... It really happens because people have different goals, different personalities and preferences when they're in a gym. Not everybody is on the same, the same wavelength. They're not all there for the same reasons. And so, for example, uh, they have, we've talked about that last week a little bit. There's weights, there's machines, there's cardio. With the machines, sometimes people like to use more than one machine at the same time. You'd say, well, Andy, how's that even possible? Well, what they do is they go back and forth because they're working different muscle groups. So they, instead of just resting in between reps, they'll jump onto another machine and work a different muscle. So they're like getting, uh, keeping their heart rate up. They're getting, uh, they're, they're more efficient with their time. Now here's the problem. If you're not paying attention, you just assume that machine's open, right? Because they're on a different machine. So you kind of got to keep your eye out. So this is, this is gym etiquette. You know, oh, that guy's using two machines. And, but when it gets busy and then you're in your own, your own zone, sometimes you, you, don't, you don't notice. And so I have unintentionally sometimes sat down or got onto a machine somebody else was, was, was using because they're using two. And then they, they, they like get ticked off, you know, like I did something wrong. So I've just kind of learned, you know, hey, I'm trying to avoid... Uh, these collisions. So I just will stand in front of a machine and look around and look to see who looks at me. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking for like, you know, a head nod and an eyebrow, kind of like, you know, like, that's mine, you know. Okay, man, this is yours. I'll cycle my way back, you know. This is your, I see you got two things going on. Uh, now, they could just throw a towel down, but they don't do that, you know. They, they, they just, you just got to know, you know. So that's, that's a piece of etiquette, right? Another piece of etiquette is that sometimes people will uh, go to the dumbbells, and most workouts include some dumbbells, and they'll, they'll grab two of the most popular dumbbells, like a 20-pound and a 25-pound. And a no matter who you are, that you're probably going to be working uh, a muscle group with a 20 or a 25-pounder. Now, if you, if you go over and get a 50-pounder, 60-pounder, you're good, man. Keep that all day long. <laughs> Nobody cares. But the real popular ones, they'll grab it and then they'll like scurry off like a mouse or something into another part of the gym. It's not even like the area we're all, we're all at with the dumbbells. And then they'll just kind of, they're going to use that for a while, you know. And just, hey, man, we're all, we want to use that. Or they'll just stay in their area, you know, right there where the dumbbells are. They'll grab, you know, you know the 20s and the 25s and maybe throw in the 30s, you know. 
like nobody else is around. And then the phone call, and then they'll take a phone call, which is a breach of another, a whole other breach of different etiquette, right? You shouldn't be talking like that in the gym, and nobody wants to hear what you have to say. And, 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 and you're sucking up the, the, you're not even using them. That's another problem. This is a breach of etiquette. One last one, okay? I could go on, but we actually have to talk about some other things. Not everybody there in the gym is, is, sees it as like their opportunity to become social. See, some people, they're very social, and they go into a gym, they see a, a room filled with people, and they go, ooh, all the people I can talk to. But see, not everybody's on that same, they're not all thinking that. Some people, they might be social, or they might not, but they're, they're there to get like a workout in and then to leave. And they have other social networks that they connect with. That's not it. And usually they'll try to, you know, send some signals. They won't, you know, they no eye contact. A lot of times they'll have earbuds cranked up loud. I mean, they're in their zone, right? But for social people, some social people, they don't know the etiquette. They'll actually tap you on the shoulder. <laughs> you know, they want to talk. And they, they want to get into a long conversation. What they don't realize is that some people, th they don't really want to let their heart rate come down. That's kind of part of their work profile, workout profile, is keep their heart rate up. They start chit-chatting and talking. Next thing you know, they've cooled down, and now they have their motivation issues going on. They, they don't want that. So that's etiquette, is kind of keep an eye on not everybody really probably wants to talk to you, okay? And sometimes that's happened to me. And uh, let, let me tell you about one. Uh, there was an elderly lady uh, sitting in a, in, a, in a recumbent bike. That's the stationary bike where you sit down. And I was kind of working through some rehab, which is why I was there, and I'm in a recumbent bike, and I'm trying to get my heart rate up, trying to strengthen my leg. And this lady, she's very old, and she, she, she leans over, and she, uh, the first time she just taps me, and she goes, uh, what is your name? Is it Steve? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, no, ma'am, my name is Andy. And then I, you know, that was it. You know, I thought, okay, minimal talking, that's fine. Anyways, a couple minutes later, she does the same thing. She leans over, kind of gets eye contact. She goes, what is your name? <laughs> so I don't want to be mean, right? Because obviously she's, you know, she probably needs a workout, you know. I think I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad she's there. So she goes, what is your name? Is it Steve? I said, no, my name is Andy. And uh, so a few minutes later, she leans over. She goes, what is your name? So I just go, my name's Steve. <laughs> and she goes, oh, she was so happy, you know. <laughs> and within a few minutes, I guess I gave her so much peace with that response, she actually falls asleep. She's no longer just, she's laying there. The, I, I took a photo. Here's my photo. <laughs> she is like crashed out, you know. So she gets a buy, you know, because, you know, where she's at in life and all. But, but generally, you know, there's, there's etiquette that you want to be aware of. And that's true in the church as well. You see, when you have a lot of people to come together, different personalities, different viewpoints, you're going to have some collisions. You're going to have uh, where we bump up against each other and we have different viewpoints and this can be a problem. It can, we, we, if we're not aware of good etiquette, we end up hurting people's feelings, we end up causing people to stumble, we end up all kinds of things. So we want to be careful about that. And so the text we're going to look at today addresses that very issue. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, we're going to go through a, a lot of that, so you'll want to open up your Bibles, open up your Bible app and follow along. Take notes, because this is something you'll want to have uh, as long as you're a part of the body of Christ, because it's, it's something you'll always need. You see, in a church, people have different responses to uh, tension also. Some people are skunks, other people are turtles, right? A skunk they have no problem letting everybody know what they think about something. I mean, they just spew and stink up the whole place, right? Other people, they're turtles, and they just retract, and they don't want to uh, get involved, and then they just, they just, they, they, they don't, they, uh, they're afraid, or, or, or maybe they just 
uh, will even leave or they get passive aggressive. There's all those other kinds of responses. But there's actually healthy ways uh, that we can communicate with one another that, that aren't just those two extremes. Like I said, we're going to talk about those there in Romans 14, and uh, <clears throat> we'll jump into it. Now, with, um, with uh, the problem that was going on in Romans is, is that you had, Paul had never been to Rome. He's writing a letter to the church in Rome, and the church in Rome had just gone through a pretty big upheaval. You see, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 40s AD, the Jews who did not believe in the Messiah had a lot of, uh, uh, of good uh, favor with the Roman government. So they had a lot of privileges. And the Jews that did believe in the Messiah, they believe in Jesus, they were, they, they were getting those same privileges. So the Jews that didn't believe in the Messiah, they thought, hey, we're going to go and, uh, to Claudius, the emperor, and appeal to him and say, hey, these really aren't real Jews. They shouldn't get the same privileges. So they do that, and it turns it backfiring on them. Claudius ends up exiling them, all of them. He says, all of you have to leave Rome. And so the Jews that didn't believe in the Messiah, those that did, all of them are gone. So therefore, there was still left a church, but it was a church that was the newer believers. They didn't know the Old Testament. And, uh, and so they had to kind of figure out where we're going to go from here. And so they started adapting and into the culture. They had the Bible. They still knew what God, you know, what the, what, what, well, some of the New Testament was obviously still being, being written. And this is it. Here is, is Romans is still being, is, is writing to them saying, here's what, how you guys need to get along. Because after seven years, the Christians, the Jewish Christians had come back and it's a new church. And now they have different understandings of things. For example, like their, what they should eat. Uh, they're over diet. That was a, a big discussion. Another one was how they should celebrate uh, Jewish holidays and, and these certain ceremonial days. Do we honor those? Do we not? And things of those nature. So he addresses those and says, here's how you get along. And, he had, and, and, and do you think that goes on in the church today, those kinds of things? Certainly, right? I mean, especially in a church like ours that's multi-ethnic, that is multicultural, that is multi-generational. People are going to have different views on the, how to treat the environment, uh, the nature of work and leisure and what, how that should be used, and education, all kinds of viewpoints. We're not all going to have the exact same viewpoint. How do we get along when we have divergent views that are, that are, uh, that are morally neutral? In other words, the Bible doesn't specifically talk to them. And this is what he addresses here. Okay, so that we see, we see um, Paul saying three things. Number one, learn to accept each other. This is the starting point. Learn to accept each other. He says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. That's a key phrase, disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. And so here he's talking about what he calls disputable matters. That's, again, morally neutral issues, but it has a lot to do with personal preference. What, what kind of keeps us connected to God? Now, the Roman Christians, what was happening is, after church service, they would jump into their chariots and go down to the local restaurant, and one would order uh, a big T-bone steak, another would go to the salad bar, and then they would sit down at the table and the one eating salad would say, well, how dare you eating that steak? Don't you know how they treat the cows and, and, uh, or that's not kosher, you know, pork ribs or whatever. And then those that are eating meat were saying, hey, it's just because you've got, you know, you're weak. You know, look, you're just eating a bunch of salad. That's rabbit food. I can't live on rabbit food. And then they would kind of squabble and go back and forth. And so Paul's addressing this. He's saying, hey, you guys need to be able to accept one another. Even if you disagree with them, you accept them. Now, how do you know if you're accepting somebody who you disagree with? Well, there's some tests that we see here in this. Number one is, is do I tend to label them? Do I label them? In other words, accept them without passing judgment. One of the worst forms of judgment is labeling. You label somebody, hey, you're just worldly. You're carnal. You know, she's a prude. You're old-fashioned. They're just a fundamentalist. 
You're a Bible thumper. You're a racist. You're anal. You're a freak. I mean, labels on and on. And in our society, we have tons of that, right? You don't agree with me. There's politicians that do that. You don't agree with me. I'm going to label you. And, and that's really just a form of judgment. And God says, in his house, don't, don't be doing that. Don't be doing that. That's certainly not accepting them. Number two is, uh, do I tend to make fun of them? Or laugh at jokes where they're the butt of the joke? The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does. And so you don't ridicule somebody. You don't laugh at them. You don't scoff. You don't uh, make fun of them. You're not snobbish. You don't have a holier-than-thou attitude and shame them like, hey, I look at what I can do. I'm a liberated Christian, and you're not. You know, you, you do not have, God says, we do not have the right to laugh at anybody's convictions, even if they're wrong. And so we can help assist them to the truth, but we don't ridicule them. We don't make fun of them. Number three, do you attempt to be their conscience? Romans 14, there, the end of verse three says, and the man who does not eat anything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Somebody defined worldliness as something that you do that I can't do. Uh, you, you can do it and I can't, so you're worldly. Well, <clears throat> you don't want to be somebody's conscience because when somebody feels, when, when we violate our conscience, we feel guilty. And that doesn't feel good. And so we fight against that. And so there's something going on there where somebody's wrestling with that. And when you try to get in and you be the referee, next thing you know, you're in the middle of the fight. And so, you know, this happens to married couples where you'll come in and they'll try to be somebody's conscience and all of a sudden the blowback is tremendous. You think it's not even that big of a deal. Well, what happened was you got in the middle of somebody's conscience and their guilt and they're fighting it out. All of a sudden, all that, that anger and that passion comes right at you. It's just really not a winnable war anyway. So it's best just not to get involved in that. You don't try to be somebody's conscience. Uh, th the Holy Spirit's actually very good at that. And so when we try to jump in and we try to be God, we end up destroying the harmony in our marriage or in our relationship with somebody, destroying the harmony in a home or in a church. And so we've got to be careful that we accept people, treating them with respect, even when we th think that they're wrong. So we accept those we ad disagree with. Now, here's the reasons. Number one is, is because God has already accepted them. Romans 14, 3 says, for God has accepted him. And then dropping down to Romans 15, 7, which because when Paul's writing this, there are no chapters and it just continues into the first part of, 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 of chapter 15. He says, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. In other words, I'm not better than God and God has accepted them. You know, I find it interesting that people that I totally disagree with, God still blesses. He doesn't check in with me at all, you know? <laughs> He doesn't say, hey, Andy, I'm thinking of handing out some blessings. How do you feel about so-and-so? Nah, they don't deserve anything. I mean, he doesn't do that. Does he? I don't think he checks in with you either, right? God's already accepted with him. And so even God could care less what I think about him. And so it's, it's number two, it's not my responsibility. Who are you to judge somebody else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. So um, I'm not their master, they're, and they're not my master, uh, they're my brother or they're my sister. I have, um, the master I have is, is to God. He's the one in charge. He's the one who is going to hand out and dole out the rewards. There's not a committee. He doesn't set up a committee and say, okay, let's take a vote. And I'm thankful for that. Proverbs 24, 11 says, it's about motive. See, God knows and judges your motives. He keeps watch on you. He knows, and he will reward you according to what you do. So I think it's, you know, we, don't, we, we can guess what we think somebody's motive is, but we really don't know. God knows. And he goes, part of the way he decides on, uh, on punishment, reward, and the things that he, that he does is motive. He can read that. We cannot. Number three, we're only accountable to God. We're only accountable to God. Now, sometimes I think we like to parent people because it gives us a sense of purpose, you know, so we want to go around and parent people. And some people, they actually want to be parented. But let me just say that, that uh, be careful of that role of, of being somebody's parent, trying to step into their life because that often ends up being uh, not helpful for anybody. Romans 14, verses 10 through 12 says, You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we, all, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. 
It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now that word judgment seat, judgment is, is bema seat, it's, it's the seat that was, um, uh, that term was used for the Olympics. Those who were, would, uh, would, they were the judges of the Olympians. And if they had to disqualify uh, somebody, it happened at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat. If they handed out rewards based on your performance, it ha happened there. And he's pulling in that term and he's saying that God is the one who sits on this seat, on this Bema seat, this judgment seat. Nobody else, only him. He's the one that we are accountable to ultimately. And we have to always remind ourselves of that. That, it's, that we answer to one and not look around and just see what everybody else is doing. You should never do, you shouldn't base your Christianity based on what other people are doing. And if there's a majority of people, oh, well, then it must be okay. That's not, no, it's you answer to God about your life and how you're going to perform. One time Peter is walking with Jesus. This is after Jesus was resurrected. Peter's re or Jesus is restoring Peter. He's calling him to follow him. And he's saying, part of following me, he tells Peter, is going to be, means that you're going to end up being crucified. Well, that's not the best news Peter's ever heard, right? So he looks around and he sees John and he points to John right in the middle of this conversation. He goes, well, what about him? Uh, what's going to happen to him? And so Jesus says something that's interesting. He says, Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. You know what he's saying? Mind your own business, right? He goes, if I want him to stay alive for 2,000 years or more, that's up to me. That has nothing to do with you and your walk and what I'm asking you to do. And the truth is, they weren't treated equally. This is what Peter's wondering. Hey, is that, am I going to get, you know, hey, this is mine. What about so-and-so? What if they get a blessing? I don't get it. And we know this about the 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 uh, 12 apostles, they had different, uh, they weren't all treated the same. Thomas was slain with a dart. Simon, uh, tradition says, the brother of Jude was crucified in an Egyptian city. Mark was burned alive. Bartholomew was beaten with sticks, crucified, and then beheaded. They wanted him dead. <laughs> Andrew was crucified. Philip was crucified, stoned to death while hanging on the cross. James was stoned by a mob and then killed with a severe blow to the head. Even Paul was beheaded by, uh, under Nero. Peter was crucified upside down. He said he wasn't worthy of being crucified unlike his Lord. But John, tradition tells us said that, that they tried to boil him in oil and, he, and the God's spirit allowed him to live. Then he ended up living out his life on Patmos, eventually dying in Ephesus in Turkey. So they, it doesn't look like it's fair. But see, so many people get caught up. Oh, you know, you know uh, I want to make sure it's fair and God's blessing this person and not... We all run our own race before God. We're accountable to, to, to God. And this is an important thing, not to get caught up comparing ourselves to other people. So accept the people even if you disagree with them. Number two, learn to accommodate each other. We accommodate each other. They're in verse 13 and 14. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in it of itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then it is for him, it is unclean. And so he says, make allowances for one another. And he's talking about these disputable matters. In other words, non-essential issues. He's not talking about discussions of, is Jesus the Son of God? No, that's an essential issue. He's talking about these other issues of dietary things and, and, uh, and, and, and keep, when do we keep the Sabbath or when do we keep uh, the, you know, some of these uh, Jewish holidays and other things that apply. Certainly we have different things uh, today. And he, and, and he says, you can, if, you get, uh, if you mess this up, you end up hurting people unnecessarily so. He says, if your brother is distressed by what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. In other words, they could end up falling into their old lifestyle. He says, uh, do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. He says, we've got to be careful. What if, what if it caused somebody to fall away from their faith? And we all know people that were that used to go to church, and they no longer go to church. Why? Because they were hurt by somebody. And so G Paul says, hey, love should be uh, a, a primary focus. So he sets some specific etiquette for accommodating 
believers. Number one, don't focus on the, ex the external, but on the eternal. And this is a key verse here in this whole passage. It is the central verse of the whole chapter. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He says, don't be sidetracked by minor issues. And he gives examples of what goes in the external things. But remember the eternal things, righteousness, love, peace. He goes, these are the central issues that hold together a church. And we need to make sure and we don't get sidetracked. When, before I was, years and years ago, I was a new, a new believer. I went to a church, and the pastor spoke. The whole sermon was about how playing guitar in church was wrong and was sinful. Now, does the Bible even mention the word guitar? No. I mean, but he tried to make it work because he didn't, you know, it was, a, it's a tr it was his own personal preference, but he was making it central for the whole church. Well, that's, that's not, you know, that's, that's not a good way to approach things. You know, taking a, a, a trivial issue and blowing it up into a big issue. You know, over the years, just over the last hundred years, there's been things that were big controversies, centerpieces of churches. And now most people just look at these issues and think, oh, yeah, no big deal. Here's some of them. Autopsies and dissection. At one time, the church was completely against this. Cremation, embalming, organ donation, smallpox vaccinations, milk pasteurization. Heart transplants, artificial contra contraception, artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization. Today, some of the things, there's a stem cell research, gun control, age restrictions for drinking alcohol, corporal punishment. Uh, the list can go on and on. And, and you go, yeah, but I have, I have strong convictions about some of those. Hey, I'm glad. That's good. But the truth is, when we look at Scripture, there's not a lot on gun control. You know, there's this, that's just not, and so you should have convictions, but when we come together, you've got to leave bandwidth because not everybody's going to have the same view as you do. So he says, build each other up, build each other up. You can go around and verbalize all of your personal preferences, but we don't want to miss this thing. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification says, this is what's important, is that we're building each other up. Now, some of you are liberated Christians. You are strong. And what that means is that you know, that even though uh, there's been taboos passed down uh, about this is a no-no, don't do that, don't do this, you look in the Bible, you see that that's not, that's not really in there. That's just taboos that are passed down. And so you're, you're a liberated Christian. You, don't, you go, hey, I don't have to do that. My, my, rela and, and my relationship is based on, if I don't see it in Scripture, it means that there's a lot of freedom for me to do things. And, and Paul says, you're strong in your faith when you, can, when you can operate like that. Then there's those who are more legalistic. They're weaker in their faith. And, and the way they view things is, is their, their relationship's a little more on rules. In other words, they, they, they need rules. And if they're operating within those rules, then they know God's happy with them. And so they... Uh, they were both sincere and they both love the Lord. It's just, the, it's just kind of where they're at in their faith. And Paul says, hey, both of you, you need to learn to love. You both learn. Don't look down. If you're a strong, liberated Christian, you don't look down on somebody. Even if you think they're wrong, go, hey, bummer for you. Look at all the stuff I get to do. He says, no. He goes, we need to be careful about that. And he says, we grow in love. We build each other up. And no, number three, we grow in love. Romans 14, 20 says, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food, for all food is clean. But it's wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So he's saying here that we limit our liberty. You may be a strong you might have strong faith. A liberated Christian, he goes, it doesn't matter. If you're around somebody else, you demonstrate your faith and your strength in your faith by limiting your liberty. You, you, you can't always do it in front of everyone. It might cause them to stumble. It might cause them to fall back in their faith, destroy their faith, all kinds of things. You know, when we, Sharon and I started having kids, we did something as young parents that a lot of young parents do, uh, that we child-proofed our home. 
right? I mean, we went, we went around, and if, if there was a cabinet that had, you know, rat poison or soap, so whatever, we'd put a lock on that. If there was something that was breakable, some china or something, we'd put that up high. I mean, we did all these kinds of child-proofing the home. Now, w- did that make it more, I- more inconvenient for me to get to certain things? Well, of course it did, right? More inconvenient. Why would we do that then? Why would we inconvenience ourselves? Out of love. We didn't want them to get hurt. We cared about them. We thought we care about them. It wasn't, there's no judgment in there. There was no cynicism. We genuinely loved these little people. We didn't want them to be hurt. So we limited our freedom. And this is what Paul's talking about. We limit our freedom. We don't flaunt our freedom around other people that don't feel like they have that freedom. And that's how we make sure workouts don't collide. That's how we make sure we get along. Do you accept one another? He says you accommodate those even if they, you don't agree. And then number three, you assert your freedom. Hey, that's cool. But in privacy, in privacy. You assert your freedom. When, you're, when it's going to be a stumbling block, when you could offend somebody and hurt their feelings, hurt not just their feelings, but hurt their faith. He says you show deference. You're considerate. You have discretion. Romans 14, 22 says, so whatever you believe about these things, broadcast it on Facebook. <laughs> right? No, he doesn't say that, right? Make a, make a YouTube video. Make some pamphlets and pass it out. Let everybody know your view. No, he doesn't say that. Right? He says, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. And so it's, we're not being two-faced. We're just... I mean, you don't, if you're a parent, you don't discuss everything in front of the kids. Some things are inappropriate. It's not like you don't believe those things. It's just, that's just not the time to discuss those things. And so you have to recognize the same kinds of things. Hey, I need to be a good manager over what I communicate, a manager of communication of what I share, of what I believe. And, uh, and, and, and he's, again, he's talking about neutral issues. They're neither bad nor good. They're, uh, many of them are conditional upon motive as we looked at just a little while ago. And, uh, and so you don't flaunt your freedom. Look at what he says here. Happy is the man who can make decisions with a clear conscience. That's the Phillips translation. A clear, in other words, we're not all, some people, they, they just feel guilty about everything, the smallest thing. They have, they have this, just they have a weak conscience. And so they feel guilty real easy. And he goes, you know, you're happy if you can strengthen your conscience. You should be able to do things with a clear conscience, not always feeling guilty about something. Now, sometimes people go, well, you know, Andy, uh, I feel good about this, and this is why I'm doing this particular behavior. And I'll say, yeah, but the Bible clearly says that that will hurt you and that that's wrong. Oh, but I feel good. Well, no, that's a, that, just because you feel okay about it doesn't mean it is okay. What he's talking about is with non-essentials, with these disputable matters, these, are, these areas that are morally neutral. He's saying in, there, in that case... It's, you're, you're, you'll be blessed if you can express your faith without feeling guilty all the time. And then in verse 5, it says, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. So he says that you should be convinced why you do what you do, not because somebody else says it's okay, because then still in your mind you're going to be going, oh, it might not be okay. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Well, this is not, he goes, you shouldn't be doing it then. If you, if you can't do it with a clean conscience, with a clear conscience. He says, he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. He says it doesn't matter whether you eat meat or eat the salad bar. As long as you're giving thanks to God, that's all that matters. So you can be a vegetarian, a carnivore, an omnivore. It does, it doesn't, it's, it's about making sure that you're uh, giving thanks to God in all that you do. He says, for none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. Now, this is important. He says, hey, we're in this together. This is, once you become a Christian, a Christ follower, you become part of the body of Christ. And he goes, we need each other. We're not an island unto ourselves. We influence each other for good and for bad. And we need to use that and be strategic about it. And then in verse 23 says, but the man who has, who has doubts is condemned if he eats because he's eating. His eating is not from faith and everything that is not done from faith is sin. 
He says, listen, if you can't eat for, f- with faith, then forget it. If you have doubts, don't. It's that simple. doesn't matter what somebody else is doing. If it's wrong for you, then just, that just that's where you're at right now. And don't be doing it. Instead of getting all caught up and trying to convince yourself of something, you're just not there. And then Romans 15, 1, he says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now, Paul obviously sides with the liberated Christian. He's saying, yeah, they're strong in their faith. And certainly, he's using a term that we would use in the gym. He's saying, and, you know, they're strong, but he says, hey, listen, you both need to serve one another. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're not there, if you're weaker and you see, you, you, in, your, in your mindset, uh, it's more about rules, and, and, and if it's unclear, you know, morally neutral, you always like to just, you know, not do it. He says, you might be strong, and you're saying, hey, if it's unclear, I, that means I can do it. He goes, both of you support one another and love one one another. Why? Because ultimately God's goal is that we are unified. Unity is more important to God than uniformity. We don't all have to think the same, be in the same cadence, be in the exact same march when it comes to everything we believe. But unity is vital. God values unity over uniformity. He says, for, and then in these last few verses, there are Romans 15, verses 4 through 6. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you what? A spirit of unity. Because that's his goal. The spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate goal. Now I love the fact that Jesus didn't make all the disciples be alike. They were different. And he was okay with that. He let them express their differences. He never tried to make them all the same. From time to time, I hear somebody say, well, I wish all of the churches would come under one denomination. I can't disagree with more. We're, we're different for different, re- for, we can reach different people. The church in Jerusalem was able to meet and reach people that Timothy and Titus could never reach. And Timothy and Titus and some of these other guys, they could reach people in Asia and in all over the Mediterranean that, that the church of Jerusalem couldn't reach. God uses all kinds of people. And that's part of embracing that, expanding our bandwidth. You know, in our day and age, it's becoming actually more narrow. Everyone's more segregated in their way they think, often along political lines. I mean, you might not even agree with your whole party's position, but it doesn't matter. And, and, and we're reinforced that in TV and all kinds of media sources. Be narrow, be passionate, be, be angry. But God says, when we come together as a body of Christ, unity is most important. And, you're, and not everybody's going to see the way things... You know, see. And people are in different stages in their walk with Christ. You know, if, if you're strong in your faith, I'll bet there was a day when you were not strong and you needed grace from other people. You needed somebody to build you up and encourage you and show you love. We need each other. We encourage one another. Okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Well, Lord, I thank you that you do not try to get our permission before you decide who you're going to bless. We answer to you. And Lord, I pray for some of you here who are here uh, right now, maybe you're online, and your, your faith, your experience with Christ has, you've looked around and you've tried to ping off of other people. You know, should I be doing this? Shouldn't I be doing that? Should I be doing this? And sometimes and that can work on some things, but on a lot of things, that will just cause us to never really be sure about our faith. We won't have a clear conscience. We'll always be kind of harangued by guilt and doubt. We won't have that flow of the relationship that God wants us to have. Some of you, God is calling out of a very 
a stringent relationship with him based on rules, whether you're in or you're out. He's saying, hey, I want you to have a, a life in faith that is not obligatory, that you have to do things, but that you get to do things. Friends, I'm telling you that if you're in a relationship with God, that it's all about have to's, there is no joy there. Joy comes from we get to do things. We get to serve we get, to pre- we get to join in this great kingdom adventure. Today, I'm going to ask you to, to step up and join with that mission that God has for you. If you've been living a life filled with guilt and, 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 and a weak conscience and, and lots of rules, would you just say, where you're at, just say, God, today, teach me the joy of serving you because I get to. And then if you're a liberated Christian, you say, hey, I'm, you know, you just went through this and you said, yeah, I'm, if it's all those disputable matters, I'm so glad that I don't have to live up to the taboos of that were passed down to me and But God is saying to you, you need to be somebody who builds people up. Encourage other people. Limit your own freedom. And do that because you are out of sheer love for somebody. And God, help us as a church body to step into loving one another and achieving unity. If you've never put your faith in Christ, would you do that right now? Say, Jesus Christ, I want to follow you. It's not about following other people. It's not even following the church. It's about following you. You say, Jesus Christ, teach me your ways. I want to walk in your footsteps. Open the scriptures to me so that I can uh, enlighten my heart so that I can understand them that they become not just words, but words of encouragement that transform me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.